uh, respected president of arthroscopy society of nepal all the dignitaries of arthroscopy society of nepal scientific chairman of arthroscopy society of nepal and all the colleagues um, a very good morning uh, on behalf of uh, arthroscopy society of nepal uh, today we are um, continuing our tradition of uh, bimonthly arthros bi bimonthly master class so <clears throat> Uh, this time, the host is Sri Birendra Hospital and coordinator is uh, Dr. Nirav Kaista. So <clears throat> we'll be discussing today about uh, the posterior cruciate ligament. So as you all know, um, the world is presently uh, paralyzed and presently haywired by uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the whole world is affected by it and whole world is in the condition of standstill at present. Uh, Nepal is no different from this pandemic and Nepal is also very hard struck by this pandemic and uh, the mortality and infectivity of uh, this second um, second variant, this second um, wave of uh, coronavirus pandemic is very, very high and um, I must say we must be very, very careful uh, to be safe uh, from this pandemic. So. As it is said, however, or whatever the darkness may be there uh, at the night, uh, the very next morning, the sun will rise again. Similarly, let's hope that we'll, um, we'll conquer this uh, pandemic with our combined effort to avoid together. Um, together, we uh, will rise again and we will defeat this pandemic. Um, as when we all know, the show must go on. Um, so we, we thought that uh, we, uh, we won't be stopping our academic activities of Arthroscopy Society of Nepal. Maybe what we thought was maybe this academic activities, uh, maybe uh, some, uh, some good thing that can happen during this pandemic, or uh, maybe uh, it may be considered as a time out uh, during this pandemic. We have been hearing about so bad things during this pandemic. So uh, why not we discuss something academic so that we, um, we think something else other than this pandemic only. So today we will be discussing about PCL. Uh, we have the, um, the host, as I have already mentioned, is Sri Birendra Hospital and man behind this all program is Dr. Nirav Kayasta. He is the coordinator. And today, <clears throat> this is um, Ason Bi-Monthly Master Class uh, by Arthroscopy Society of Nepal. Today, we'll be discussing about PCL. We have divided this program into two parts. First, there will be two didactic lectures. Uh, first one will be given by Anatomy and Biomechanics of PCL. Next, the coordinator himself will uh, talk about uh, decision-making in PCL injury. And then second part of today's program will be case-based panel discussion uh, with very eminent um, panelist, Professor Amit Joshi, Dr. Rajiv Rajanandar, and Dr. Nabin Karn. And <clears throat> moderator, I myself, Dr. Vivek Basukala will be moderating the session. Uh, thank you so much. And let us start um, the today's scientific program. The first talk will be by uh, Dr. Susil Thapa, a very talented and uh, budding arthroscopic surgeon from Chiton, a good friend of mine. So, uh, Susil, all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Vivek, for the flattering introduction. I'm Susil Thapa from Bharatpur Hospital. <laughs> and of course, as Vivek said, the sun will rise again, and the <clears throat> virus is not going to halt our learning and teaching activities and these types of academic activities <clears throat> and it's always been a privilege to talk on behalf of the arthroscopy society of nepal <clears throat> i'll throw light on the surgical anatomy and biomechanics very pertinent anatomy and biomechanics of the posterior cruciate ligament <clears throat> i'll talk on these topics the bundles of the pcl their attachment septum knob supply, vascularity, and biomechanics. To begin with, the posterior cruciate ligament is, <clears throat> it's an extra synovial ligament. It is attached on the medial femoral condyle, and the length is 32 to 38 millimeter, while the cross section is 13 millimeter square. And the femoral attachment is twice as large as the tibial attachment. <clears throat> and it's divided into anterior lateral bundle, which is larger, 
and the posterior medial bundle, which is smaller. The anterior lateral bundle, the tensile strength is approximately four times as much as that of posterior medial bundle. And the, the attachment at the femoral side is smaller, posterior medial bundle is smaller than that of anterior lateral bundle. So when we're trying to reconstruct, or when you reconstruct the posterior cruciate ligament in single bundle reconstruction, we try to reproduce anterior lateral bundle rather than the posterior medial, posterior medial bundle. That's because the attachment of the AL bundle is bigger and the, uh, the tensile strength is approximately four times as much as that of posterior medial bundle. And the conventional understanding is that the posterior <laughs> medial bundle is taught in extension while anterior lateral bundle is taught in flexion. But there are certain cadaveric studies that have proved that these two bundles act synergistically. It may be in flexion or extension. They, they, are, they are taught almost to the equal extent in flexion and extension. <clears throat> and it's very interesting or it's very important to learn the distal articular cartilage anatomy of the femoral condyles. This is the right knee at 90 degree of flexion. <clears throat> and this is the sketchy picture of the same. And there is a sulcus terminalis. <clears throat> this is a sulcus on the lateral condyle. And this sulcus terminalis, this meets the edge of the cartilage at a convex point. And this convexity goes anteriorly, anteriorly and becomes the apex of the intracondylar knots. This is the apex of the intracondylar knots. And as we go medially from the apex of the intracondylar knots, there is a convexity here. <coughs> this is the convexity. And the, the end of the convexity is the trochlear point. And as we move posterior medially, it forms a medial arch. And this arch ends at a point called medial arch point. This is a medial arch point. And then the <clears throat> cartilage goes straight downwards. This is the straight cartilage. And here is the posterior point as well. And there is another osseous landmark. This is very important osseous landmark. This is both visible and palpable, and this is present along the medial intercondylar ridge. This is called bifurcate prominence. So now we have we've got three points: trochlear point, medial arch point, and bifurcate prominence. And if we take the center of this prominence, center of this triangle, then that forms the center of anterior lateral bundle. Though bifurcate prominence may be difficult to visualize in case in the live knees. But if, if we clear the uh, footprint of the PCL, we may see the bifurcate prominence, but we don't actually clear the entire footprint because of several reasons we discussed in the later slides. So if we take the center here, and if we make a drill hole here, it forms the anterior lateral bundle. This is anterior lateral bundle. And beneath the posterior to the anterior lateral bundle is posterior medial bundle. This is smaller as shown in the figure itself. And anterior to the posterior medial bundle is anterior, anterior meniscus femoral ligament, also called ligament of Humphrey. And posterior is posterior meniscus femoral ligament, also called ligament of Risberg. And these two meniscus femoral ligament sort of clasp the, uh, clasp the posterior cruciate ligament like, uh, like, a, like a fork. And Thereby, this provides stability to the posterior cruciate ligament in case the PCL has been torn. On top of that, the ligament of Humphrey and Risberg, they also provide a certain degree of anterior posterior stability. And these ligaments are attached to the lateral meniscus posterior horn. And again, it's very pertinent to understand the anatomy of the tibial condyle as well. This is the posterior view of uh, of the tibial condyles. And this is the medial tibial condyle. And this is the mid sagittal section, as we see in the MRI. And this is the lateral tibial condyle. So the anatomy is quite different from, as you go from the medial to the lateral. It's, it is not uniform as we see in the plain X-ray. And let's focus on the mid sagittal section here. This can be compared with the Sampen class. This is a Sampen class. 
and this is the convexity, the slope going anteriorly. And if we compare this champagne glass drop up to the mid sagittal section, this can be compared. Like this, this looks like a champagne glass. And this point is called champagne glass drop up CGD. This is the point actually. And the slope goes suddenly and anteriorly. As, and, and it resembles the champagne glass. So this is also called champagne glass drop up. And there is another facet called PCL facet. This is a shallow depression where the PCL is attached. So we try to uh, we try to make a drill hole somewhere around the, this PCL facet here in case of PCL reconstruction. And another important point is the popliteus muscle. This lies just sorry this lies just beneath the capsule. Uh, this purple circle represents the capsule. So if we are able to see popliteus muscle, either it's been torn because of trauma or we, we've, uh, we've made injury to the capsule so much so that the popliteus muscle is visible. So this is the mid sagittal section and it's very important to learn, understand the anatomy of the mid sagittal section. And both the anterolateral bundle and the posterior medial bundle they, they take their attachment, tibial attachment in this facet. And this is the mid sagittal section. Have, this is the popliteus muscle. And this is sampan glass drop up. It is actually not transverse. It is actually oblique that goes from, that grows to a lateral part and the superior part. So this is how CGD also called sampan glass drop up is formed. And this is the popliteus muscle just beneath the seven glass drop of popliteus muscle is visible. So uh, during surgery, we don't want to actually visualize the popliteus muscle. We stay proximal to the, this muscle. And there is another ridge called bundle ridge. This actually separates the anterolateral bundle from the posterior medial bundle. And the bundles take their name, anterior, posterior, from the attachment on the tibia, not from the femur. And there's another landmark called shiny white fibers. These fibers are present just beneath the posterior root of the middle meniscus. So, and uh, this is the important landmark. This is very shiny and can be, it's visible in few cases of PCL reconstruction. And we should be very careful while releasing the septum or while, while working on this depression because not to be injured, especially the medial meniscus posterior root that lies slightly posterior as compared to the lateral meniscus. <clears throat> and we should also be careful not to make the ramp lesions and not to injure the coronary ligaments that are present around these areas. Actually, this is a very small area. So <clears throat> this is the, the blue one represents the anterolateral bundle and this one represents the posterior medial bundle. Actually, we try to reproduce the anterolateral bundle in single bundle reconstruction of the PCL. And the septum anatomy is again, very important to understand. This is the septum actually is the, uh, this layer. This is the layer that attaches the posterior aspect of the PCL all the way up to the capsule. So in case of fully extended knee, the distance from the PCL attachment site to the, this neurovascular structure is about four millimeters. And this is the septum. Actually, the septum lies very close to the popliteal artery. And this is formed out of two thin fibrous membranes with intervening fat and synebium. It has intervening fat and the outer layer is synebium. But as we flex the knee, the, the neurovascular structure goes slightly posteriorly, but that, that may not be sufficient enough to, to uh, take the neurovascular structure much farther posteriorly. So what is, what is the way out? What is, what is the way to stay much away from the neurovascular structure? We, we actually release the septum here. This is the septum part. And the superior part of the septum has some vascularity. So we don't want to disturb the superior portion of the septum because it has some vascularity and it's going to supply the blood vessel to the new, new reconstructive graft. So we stay inferiorly and anteriorly, not posteriorly. So we take, we make two portals. 
posterior medial and posterior lateral. We need to make the portals because if we work only with the anterior lateral and anterior medial portals, the blind spot is approximately 21.5% 21, 21 So we want to make two more portals. And if we do not re release the septum, even after making the portals, then the blind spot is still 8.4% So we don't, we want 0% blind spot. For 0% blind spot, that is no blind spot, we have to release the septum. And another advantage of the septum is after releasing the septum, the distance from the, the tibial tunnel of the PCL up to the neurovascular structure increases from 4.4 millimeters to 14.7 millimeters. It's approximately one centimeter posteriorly. So the neurovascular structure goes one centimeter posteriorly and we've got enough room to play uh, with very little risk of injuring the neurovascular structure. And on top of that, the blind spot is approximately zero percent with this transeptal release. This was actually proposed by Anne et al. in 2007. <clears throat> and the, this posterior posterior ligament has a lot of mechanoreceptors. These are more concentrated on the femoral, uh, femoral attachment. So there is a reason we don't want to disturb, we don't want to damage the native footprint of the PCL, especially in the femur, because there are a lot of mechanoreceptors. And this is uh, the concept behind the remnant preserving PCL reconstruction. So because of this reason, we may not see the bifurcate prominence as, as I talked in the first slide. And these mechanoreceptors are also present on the superior part of the septum. And because of this reason, we don't want to divide the superior part of septum. We want to stay on the inferior part of the septum. And uh, the vasculite is by middle genicular artery. Biomechanics of PCL is actually uh, uh, oversimplified in this slide because <clears throat> it's, it's uh, quite complicated and we can understand in different, different manners. Uh, this is a rigid bar actually, and this is the green one represent PCL while the blue one represent the anterior ligament. So this rigid bar is not going, going to change from extension to flexion. While these three bars, they change their position. And knee actually is not, not purely gliding motion and not purely, it's actually a combination of gliding with rolling motion because of which this, this uh, flexion is possible. And as we flex our knee, the center of motion gradually changes, goes towards posteriorly. That's because of different radius of curvature of the femur at different points. And this portion has wider radius of curvature, while this portion has smaller radius of curvature, because of which the gliding and rolling motion is possible here, or has to take place. And it is the ACL and PCL that guide this gliding and rolling motion. So the reconstruction of the ACL and PCL, the tunnels has to be Tonnets have to be very precise. So as you flex the knee, the rigid bar stays in its position while other bars change their position in this way. This is the biomechanics of PCL and this is called four bar linkage system because it cons consists of four bars. Uh, another biomechanical function of the PCL is it resists the transmission of tibia. And this is the PCL intact knee and the PCL def deficit knee. So uh, as it resists the posterior translation in PCL deficit knee or PCL torn knee, the tibia tends to go posteriorly. So the pressure on the patellar femoral joint is increased because of this posterior sagging, especially in the flexion in, wide, in deeper degrees of flexion. Because of this increase in patellar femoral pressure, the Femoral OA osteoarthritis sets in, and the patient complains of ankle knee pain uh, in, in case of chronic cases. And it's again, it's very interesting to note that uh, in the early stage, the patient complains of pain on the posterior aspect of the knee because of the pathology, because of the PCL tear. But as the chronicity sets in, the patient has patellofemoral osteoarthritis 
and he complains of pain on the anterior aspect of the knee. And the chronic it is, the more the pain may uh, be complained of by the patient. And the weight bearing mechanics is disturbed here. In case of PCL intact knee, the weight passes through the venisci and then to the tibia. But in case of deficient knee, as the tibia sags posteriorly, the weight transmits the kinematics of the, this knee joint gets disturbed. And all the weight may not pass through the meniscus, some weight may pass through the, the cartilage as well. So this leads to medial compartment osteoarthritis, most probably on the middle part, not on the lateral part, most probably because of the middle menisci are firmer than the lateral menisci. And the lateral meniscus, because of its attachment with the uh, femoral condyle via meniscal femoral ligament, the lateral menisci tend to move with the femoral condyles. So the weight passes in the lateral meniscus through the meniscus, uh, in the lateral compartment through the meniscus to the tibia in spite of the PCL tear. While in the middle compartment, since the middle meniscus is formed, the weight passes through the, the femoral cartilage directly to the tibial cartilage, thereby causing middle compartment osteoarthritis. So these are two important considerations in case of a PCL tear. Another consideration is PCL, uh, PCL's action is also to resist the external rotation of tibia. So in case, of, uh, in case the PCL has been torn, the tibia rotates externally, or in case of closed chain motion, the femur rotates internally. Because of internal rotation of the femur, the pressure is more on the lateral patellar femoral uh, area. So the, the osteoarthritis is more on the lateral patellar femoral articulation. Uh, rather than uh, rather than in the whole of the uh, patellar femoral cartilages, so these these are the primary actions to resist the posterior translation and uh, external rotation. And besides this, there are other structures like popliteal fibrillar ligament, the collateral ligament, of course the calf steel that that help the PCL in uh, in these biomechanics in resisting the external rotation and in resisting the posterior translation of the tibia. So this is another cause for patellar femoral osteoarthritis in case of PCL deficient knee. Uh, this is a very brief on the anatomy and biomechanics of the posterior cruciate ligament. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Susil. That was wonderful presentation, a pictorial. Um, you made a lot of things very difficult, a difficult thing very clear with the, your presentation. So. Uh, Amit sir asked uh, um, in the chat box, uh, in my experience in 40% of cases, shiny white fibers are not seen. What do you suggest? To expose the shiny white fiber or look for some other bony prominences for PCL reconstruction, tibial tunnel? Yes, yes sir. Uh, the, the shiny white fibers are very closer to the medial meniscus posterior root and other important structures like coronary ligament of the medial meniscus is present. Uh, I think we should not uh, look for the shiny white fibers by dividing all the fat and all the soft tissues around the shiny white fibers if we do not find them. So we should look for other bony landmarks rather than looking for the shiny white fibers if we do not find them. So Susil, my question is in continuity the same. So um, when doing PCL reconstruction, what we find is uh, while dissecting the posterior part, the posterior tibial uh, attachment of the uh, the PCL, uh, the bony attachment, bony landmarks are even difficult to uh, identify. So we are looking from posterior side and um, the, the few fibers of, of to, to have the good look of bony landmarks, you have to expose whole of the footprint. You have to uh, eat away all, all the PCL remnants. So how to get uh, any tri uh, technical tips? Uh, yes, uh, no, we don't have Actually, you see the boundaries may be difficult to see. And as Amit sir said, it's seen in the shiny white fibers are seen in only 40 percent. So I think the tip is to stay along the midline, mid sagittal section of the uh, uh, tibial attachment of the PCL phobia. And another uh, tip may be to use the CR fluoroscopy, uh, make the tunnel with the bit pin or the guide wire and then use the CRM to localize the precise location of the PCL tunnel. 
And another is sometimes we see the pubgis muscle uh, inadvertently because of the injury or because of the uh, because of while we are dissecting the uh, septum on the posterior aspect. And uh, if we find this. Uh, uh, muscles of the popliteus, we stay slightly proximal and enter to the popliteus. Okay, uh, Amit sir. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is very interesting, you know. Uh, when you do a ACL reconstruction, uh, the TBL tunnel is very easy to make, the femoral tunnel is difficult. Whereas when you go to PCL, it is femoral tunnel which is very easy to make, uh, but the TBL tunnel is difficult to make. The remnant preserved, if the remnant is preserved, making the TBL tunnel is very, very difficult. So you have to assess uh, the MRI to identify which part of the PCL is torn and which part is preserved. If the TBL part is preserved, then you have to make sure that you go, when you do a transeptal dissection, you go posterior to the PCL. So if you come in the transeptal dissection, if you are anterior to the PCL, then whole of the PCL footprint has to be removed. If you go posterior to the PCL, then you don't need to. You just remove the septum. Your PCL will be on your anterior side, your capsule and the vessel will be on posterior side and you can go very easily. So that is one of the very important trick that when you make your transeptal portal, read your MRI properly, identify either the TBL portion of the PCL is uh, intact, then you have to identify the PCL and while making the transeptal, you go posterior to the PCL, then your dissection will be easy. Identification of the landmark will be easy. Here, two things have to be understood. If you have remnant, then don't you don't need to look for the bony landmark. The remnant is the landmark for you. You don't need to identify the, you know, all those uh, bony ridges. But if there are no remnant preserved, then it is difficult to identify the correct location of the PCL footprint. Then you identify these bony landmarks. Uh, I think um, uh, Sushil made a very lucid presentation, and that was excellent. That um, you know uh, how simple uh, um, you know PCL anatomy can be demonstrated. This is the extreme of uh, demonstration of a uh, PCL anatomy. Thank you very much, Sushil. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Susil. That was wonderful presentation. We will continue about some anatomy or some technical tips uh, during our panel discussion as well. So let's uh, move on. Uh, next, um, uh, uh, we have Dr. Nirav Kaista. He will be discussing about decision making in PCL injury. Uh, respected seniors, uh, thank you again for this uh, chance to present my. A small talk on PCL PS and decision making. So, when we have uh, PCL PS, it is uh, since it is not as uh, usual as we come across uh, ACL PS, the, there might be some uh, difficulty in deciding when to uh, proceed with the uh, lethal procedure or whether to leave the patient uh, for conservative management. So. Okay. Um, the anatomy and the biomechanics uh, was very lucidly uh, presented by uh, Sushil, as always. Uh, very pleasant to look at and very understandable. So the injury that we come across uh, in the PCL uh, when, we, when we talk about PCL are the usual dashboard injuries, the, the very usual ones and very common ones. Uh, there might be uh, very little uh, percentage of injuries. There might be hyperextension injuries of the uh, knee, uh, mostly the sporting injuries in the football field, for example. And the other one is another type of sporting injuries where the knee is hyperflexed with the, uh, with the ankle in anterflexed position. And for some reason, uh, this uh, tends to tear the PCL, uh, which gives us the classic pictures of a PCL injury. Uh, 
in our context uh, in nepal's context of course uh, it is most of, uh, mostly the road traffic accidents that um, that are that are there uh, and um, of course uh, they need to be given the uh, same kind of uh, attention regarding the other possible injuries that might be present with the uh, injuries so in uh pcl injuries the, they might be other associated injuries also uh in 3% of all the knee injuries pcl is uh, injured and in most of the grade three injuries of the pcl they are concurrent injuries to other ligamental structures uh in up to about say, uh, 80% of the uh, injury so uh pcl is uh, pcl is injured during about 62% of pcl injuries Uh, ACL is also injured in about forty-six percent, and uh, middle collateral ligament might be injured in thirty-one percent of the ACL injuries. So, this table shows what other associated injuries uh, might there be. Uh, in type one injuries, for example, uh, there is only ACL is stretch. There is laxity, uh, which we usually see for the clinical examination. Uh, less than five uh, millimeter of laxity uh, is there, then it is uh, grade one. In grade two, PCL ligament is torn. Uh, the the uh, other ligaments are intact, but there might be a little more of laxity up to ten uh, millimeters. And when there is more than ten millimeter of laxity, the PCL is torn, uh, but the other uh, ligaments might be uh, intact. But in this case, the draw test shows us. uh what is the grade of laxity in uh, laxity is more than 10 mm it be injured due to us as shown in this uh, table uh, for example uh, there might be lateral collateral ligament or postlateral injuries and medial collateral ligament or there might be inju uh, injury to uh, acl as well as pcl uh, where there is um, more than 15 mm of laxity so uh, in this case uh, the injury of uh, grade 3 uh, seems to be more important uh, which shows us whether to go with uh, conservative management or the uh, operative treatment will be uh, proper for the uh, particular patient patient uh, with acute injuries might come with uh, uh, pain and uh, effusion and the in history they might be high or low energy trauma and they might be hyperflexion athletic injuries or they might be history of dislocation which we might be uh, very much uh, prudent uh, to elicit if there is any neurologic injury or injury to uh, vessels in chronic injuries there might be uh, posterior knee pain and uh, very little of the stability uh, in the in the acute cases but in the chronic cases uh, of course the patient might uh, also complain of instability but in uh, cases of uh, possible uh, dislocation of the knee the, we always must be uh, able to elicit uh, the red flag signs which might be injury to the vascular structures or they might be nerve injuries uh, and uh, inability to uh, relocate the knee uh, might be a very ominous sign uh, In chronic ACL injuries, there might be uh, anterior knee pain, uh, and there might be difficulty with uh, going up and down the stairs, and the patient might also uh, complain of instability. For clinical examinations, the draw test, the posterior draw test, is the most common and uh, usually done test, uh, as uh, shown in the table earlier. Uh, the knee in its normal attitude is. Uh, of uh, grade zero, uh, and so the uh, tibial uh, the tibial plateau is about uh, one centimeter anterior to the femoral condyle. In grade one laxity, uh, the tibial plateau is still anterior, but uh, there is laxity as compared to the normal side. In grade two laxity, there is the tibial plateau is uh, 
uh, flush with the uh, femoral condyle. And in grade three, uh, the tibial plateau goes posterior to the uh, uh, femoral condyle as shown in the uh, sag sign. The, the second picture shows us the sag sign where the tibial plateau is going posterior to the uh, femoral condyle. This is also well seen in uh, the uh, sag test when you hold the uh, patient's ankle in your hands with the patient's supine uh, with knee in 90 degree of flexion. The proximal tibia and the injured side sags posteriorly due to gravity, and we can see the sagging of the proximal tibia. And one of the important uh, examination is quadriceps active test. This can be done uh, with patient in the supine position at about 60 degree of uh, knee flexion. The foot is held, uh, supported with the examiner's hand, and the patient is asked to actively flex, uh, contract the quadriceps, which will show uh, this type of uh, picture. As you can see, the patient is actively moving the uh, proximal part of the tibia. This is the quadriceps active test. If it is there, then uh, we are very much sure that PCL has been injured. Uh, with the injury of a PCL, uh, since PLC, the posterior lateral corner injuries might also be there, we must be uh, we must try to elicit the uh, PLC in injuries also. So the diuretics is very um, uh, important to elicit this uh, uh, injury. So in uh, patient in uh, prone position, uh, if there is more than 10 degree of uh, external rotation of the foot uh, in 40 degrees of uh, knee flexion, then it is uh, PLC is injured. And if there is uh, more than 30 degree of external rotation, both in degree of knee flexion as well as in 90 degree of knee flexion, then uh, PCL as well as PLC are injured. So the other investigation that we usually, of course, do uh, would be the X-rays. Uh, to uh, show uh, things like, for example, reverse Sigon factor, which is indirect evidence of PCL injury. Uh, there might be lateral collateral uh, injuries, uh, which are shown in the version of the uh, uh, fibular head, or there might be uh, version of the PCL uh, from the uh, tibial plateau, uh, tibial attachment site, uh, which is shown in this case, which we had recently. Uh, in grade three injuries of the uh, uh, PCL, uh, when there are no other evidences in uh, pain X-rays, we can do the stress X-ray of the knee uh, with the knee in about 70 degree of flexion. Uh, a bolster can be placed uh, on the proximal tibia, and uh, X-rays are taken from lateral side. The lateral view would show uh, this type of picture. Uh, it shows the tangential line, the, uh, the posterior of the uh, tibia which is shifted posteriorly uh, than the uh, angle of the Blumenthal line uh, as compared to the normal lateral side uh, where the line is anterior to the uh, Blumenthal uh, angle. So the other investigation, very important one uh, is MRI. Uh, it shows not only the ligamentous injury, it, might show, uh, it can show the other injuries like the chondral injuries or uh, the um, of tissue structures. Uh, in this picture, uh, we see the partial tear, uh, and the, in C and D, for example, uh, shows uh, another, another partial tear uh, where the, uh, the substance of PCL itself is torn. And the last picture, the E and F, shows revulsion uh, from the femoral attachment site. In one of the cases that we uh, recently had, uh, it was uh, mid substance uh, tear of the PCL. And yet another one, uh, there, is there, there was evolution from the uh, tibial attachment site where this segment is And the wavy uh, PCL uh, is seen here, which shows the uh, PCL tear, PCL evolution factor of the knee. Uh, arthroscopic view also, there is uh, indirect evidence, uh, which is shown by the uh, waviness of uh, PCL, uh, 
uh, which shows the PCL has been torn. This is also indirect evidence uh, of the PCL uh, injury. So what happens uh, uh, during PCL injury and why are we so interested uh, to do the uh, PCL reconstruction or uh, repair if, in cases of uh, it was in Decreased forces in medial and portal femoral compartments uh, gives rise to arthrosis, as already uh, told by uh, Cecil in the previous uh, lecture. And the posterior subluxation of medial tibial plateau uh, behaves like a medial meniscus resection. In the shear motion of the uh, joint, it gives uh, in the swing phase of running and swing and early stance phase of stair climbing. And they have also uh, shown that preoperatively, PCL deficient knees, uh, they are much worse uh, versus the ACL deficient knees because there is altered uh, and altered loading of the knee cartilage and the posterior lateral corner. Uh, this is a very useful treatment uh, algorithm. In cases of acute injuries with, uh, with isolated or combined uh, in isolated injuries, if it is grade one or two, then the patient can be uh, advised for conservative man management. In grade three uh, or combined injuries, if the combined if the pre patient presents with combined injuries, then usually they will go for operative management uh, because of obvious reasons to avoid the process. In grade three, if the patient is young and athletic, and if there is a worsening injury, they will uh, be good with operative treatment. In cases of young injury, young patients with uh, grade three injuries, but uh, not very active lifestyle, they might uh, opt for uh, non-operative management as well. So the uh, main mainstay of treatment would be the uh, young athletic boy if there is elderly, if there is combined injury to the uh, knee. In cases of chronic injury, again the same thing. The injury might be isolated or combined. Uh, in isolated cases, grade one or two, uh, we won't be needing to do anything with the patient. In grade three, uh, whether there is uh, symptomatic pain or instability, uh, that is one very important thing, or whether uh, or not there is malalignment. If there is malalignment, and if there are persistent symptoms uh, despite of the uh, physiotherapy that is given, then they will go for operative management. And in combined uh, cases, combined injuries, uh, it is better that they would be uh, they will undergo operative management for their uh, injury. So the important thing in the chronic injury would be uh, the malalignment uh, that might uh, the, the patient, patients might present with. In non-operative treatment, uh, they can be given uh, rest and uh, ice compressions. And work in dynamic knee, dynamic PCL knee braces, quadriceps uh, exercises, and po to, post uh, to eliminate the posterior sac. This specific type of uh, brace is very important. Uh, in phase two, about six to twelve weeks, uh, they would be given full range of motion, quadriceps exercises, uh, and for three to four months, uh, the PCL brace would be there. In uh, third phase, initiation of running and sports uh, specific activity can be initiated. But all these things can be uh, given to the patient according to the uh, specific need uh, of the particular patient. So indications for surgery would be in acute injuries, if there is PCL injury with knee dislocations, and if the stress radiograph indicates uh, more than 12 millimeter of laxity, which shows uh, multiligamentous injuries. Complete PCL tears with increased anterior posterior laxity more than eight millimeters with repairable meniscal body or uh, tears, which might be shown in the MRI. And in chronic cases, the functional limitations due to PCL tear, uh, difficult with, uh, difficulty with deceleration, inclined descents uh, in the stairs, if PCL stress radiography laxity is more than eight millimeter, and if there is uh, absence of contraindications to ligamentous, uh, ligamentous reconstructions like arthritis, uh, vascular or skin compromise. So the operative procedure might be transtibial tunnel technique, which is the mainstay, the, the uh, more often known procedure. Uh, the graph might be uh, photographs, the hamstrings, uh, or the 
the quadriceps tendon. Uh, but, uh, bone quadrilateral tendon bone grafts. Uh, Mark Friedman in his, uh, in his talk uh, described this pillar turn, uh, which, is, uh, which is one of the uh, creative aspects of uh, transmibial technique. So this portion that is shown uh, is described as the pillar turn, which uh, gives, to, gives a way to weakening of the graft as, is, as it passes. Uh, The TV in the long run. The PCL uh, after reconstruction uh, shows that the uh, uh, lax PCL is uh, made out. For example, if there's uh, injuries like the medial collateral ligament, uh, when they are also concomitantly re uh, reconstructed, uh, it is also uh, addressed properly. The drive through sign, which is seen here uh, in this picture, is is uh, is corrected in this uh, text picture. So the complications of uh, oscoscopic PCL uh, reconstruction is one of the dreaded ones: uh, the possible injury to uh, popliteal vessels. Uh, really, in his uh, paper, uh, quoted of 0.8 percentage of uh, injury to the uh, vascular structures. Uh, Small in his another paper uh, cited 0.56 to 1.6 percent of uh, injuries. So to uh, get away from this uh, difficulty, uh, as Priscilla um, said, uh, trans trans uh, transportal uh, transeptal portal uh, in the posterior part of the uh, knee joint while doing the PCL reconstruction is very uh, helpful. This is how the uh, transeptal portal looks like uh, in the uh, arthroscopic view. The PCL lies posterior to the uh, working side. Uh, is the neurovascular, anterior to the uh, working side, this is the neurovascular bundle pushed posteriorly, and this is the transeptal portal. And one another way of uh, avoiding the Injuries to the neurovascular bundle is uh, tibial inlay technique, in which uh, patient is placed prone and with the uh, open technique, the uh, graft, uh, the, the bone the bone graft uh, of the, uh, the the graft is placed in the uh, proximal part of the tibia, in the slot, uh, screw, uh, the appropriate implant. And the rest of the part, rest of the reconstruction is completed by arthroscopic technique. And uh, in the in the femoral tunnel, uh, it is uh, placed with the arthroscopic uh, procedure. Postoperatively, the brace with tibial support is given to the patient. Uh, and for addressing the chronic pixel deficient deficiencies, uh, we need to address it properly because. Uh, as I described, posterior PCL injuries uh, give external rotation and posterior translation of the proximal tibia relative to femur. And it is more seen in uh, flexion angles of more than 60 degrees. These translations uh, significantly increase while walking and stair ascent and increase hyperextension in all phases of the gait cycle. So, uh, in concomitant PCL injuries, there are uh, these triple. Uh, Deficiencies: the femoral virus is there, the attenuation of the lateral soft tissues, and hyperextension secondary to an uh, injured PCL. So, in chronic PCL injuries, the way out is high tibial osteotomy, where the uh, decrease uh, the decreased uh, slope uh, is corrected by increasing the, uh, the uh, osteotomy. This is biplanar osteotomy, where the uh, possible virus. Uh, as well as the uh, the tibial uh, slope is corrected at the same time. So in re rehabilitation, uh, immobilization in extension uh, is given, and the uh, protection against cavity is important. Only motion is given uh, in 
and uh, avoiding resisted hamstring uh, strengthening exercises uh, taken care of. Outcomes in any type of uh, technique, the isolated and combined PCL reconstruction or different graft choices uh, dif in different degrees of knee dislocation uh, and uh, single versus double bundle reconstruction uh, seem to be similar. The only difference in uh, double bundle posterior reconstruction, post posterior uh, ligament reconstruction is that uh, the translation is less in the double bundle reconstruction, but usually uh, we, we have been doing single bundle reconstruction and they quote that it is not so much different. Uh, thank you. Stay safe. Uh, thank you so much, Niratai. That was an excellent presentation. So uh, Dr. Buddhi has asked, uh, there are a few questions in chat box. So Dr. Buddhi has asked, inter-rater reliability of laxity test and its significance of uh, it among sports surgeon and regular trauma surgeon. Are there any difference between the inter-rater reliability of laxity test between the sports surgeon and regular trauma surgeon? Nirabdai, if you can uh, on-screen your uh, screen so that we can see each other. Uh, so, uh, so Did it go? Uh, no, no. Mati top ma on share one new sense. Stop share one new sense. Stop sharing the can new share. Top, 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 top ma, Mati. Okay, we timely start sharing. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay. okay, so the question uh, is is there any inter yes. rate of reliability change in inter rate of reliability? Yes, I think uh, there would be some uh, there would be some difference in uh, observation because uh, once you start to uh, see the patients more frequently, uh, then the then, then the uh, clinical differences in the laxity, the I think would be uh, more noticeable to the uh, person who has been doing the cases or seeing the patients more frequently. Yes, I do agree this thing because one who is doing lots of uh, lots uh, one who is seeing and doing lots of these cases uh, will uh, definitely uh, grade this you know, re laxity test more better than the other one. So the main uh, principle or main uh, funda is you you have to do it more often. Uh, whenever there is cases of knee uh, knee problem or knee injury in your OPDs, try to elicit all these tests and uh, try to compare with the other than normal knee. So I think we can master this technique by practice only. So another question is from Dr. Manoj Das. He asks, any role of posteromedial safety incision and how often is it done in your practice? Sorry, once again. Uh, any role of posteromedial safety incision in PCL reconstruction and how often do you do it? Posteromedial safety incision. Uh, Just like means, uh, when we do uh, the uh, uh, inside portal? out. Yes. Yes, sir. Posteromedial portal? No, no, no. Just, just as oh, we do the in the, the posteromedial the... safety incision. Posteromedial safety incision as we do in uh, the uh, posterior horn mid. Uh, Vivek, uh, Vivek. Uh, let me intervene because uh, it has gone a little longer. Uh, posteromedial safety incision was a very popularly used uh, some years back when people uh, they did not use a uh, posteromedial and the posterolateral portal. So posteromedial safety incision was very commonly used for those people who were not trained to do all the surgery from anteromedial and anterolateral and to make the tibial tunnel of posteromedial safety incision was used. Uh, how much we use? Um, this depends upon uh, what you learn and how you have learned this technique, you know. Uh, but uh, the posteromedial incision is very rarely done nowadays. Only in those people who, you, who have learned this technique, they do it. I agree. So, can, can I add to that a little bit? Can I add to that? Yes, yes. 
Yeah, so basically, I agree with Amit. Basically, see, uh, we have seen generations of PCL. We are, we've become slightly older. We've seen in generations on how the PCL control and open incision was made and inlay graft. Then came this posterior medial incision. So see, you have a lot of fear, right, when you're doing the PCL. I'm sure Amit would agree when we initially start the PCL, there's a lot of fear. And then you want to find out whether that exit is going to hit the vascular structures or not at the back, the vessel. So you feel very comfortable when you make a posterior medial incision and put your finger inside. So you can actually feel the mammillary body. You can feel all the structures there. And you can actually feel your uh, beads pin coming and hitting your finger. So that's the safety incision. And even the C arm was used. So I, I think over the years, we have seen all this progress. But now I think the posterior medial incision is more of history. I think it's more historical. Maybe used by certain people when they begin to learn. But I think it's more historical. What do you say, Amit? Amit, are you there? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I, yeah. I absolutely okay. agree that uh, posterior medial safety incision uh, is very rarely used nowadays. Only by those people, you know, who learned, uh, who have a concept that you shouldn't go posteriorly. Posterior medial and posterior lateral portal are more riskier than the making a safety incision. Only those people do that. I think the posterior medial safety incision are more uh, made nowadays during the uh, inside out meniscus repair than in the PCL reconstruction. Uh, so I think we have to proceed. We are behind the time. We are lagging in the time. So the next is the panel discussion on posterior cruciate ligament injuries. This will be a sort of uh, case-based panel discussion. And uh, as we all know, uh, we have uh, we, we had discussion about PCL uh, last time as well, uh, almost about one year back. So uh, let us discuss about PCL injury again. So <clears throat> today my panelists are Dr. Amit Rupsi, uh, Dr. Rajiv Raj Manandar and Dr. Navin Karn. Uh, so uh, we have discussed about this uh, topic, PCL injuries, uh, uh, almost about one year back, as I've already mentioned. And at that time also, we have all uh, three panelists, same three panelists. So I was, moderate, uh, I was moderating the session at that time also. So I think this will be panel discussion part two for PCL injuries. And I would like to request all the uh, um, colleagues to subscribe this Arthroscopy Society of Nepal channel in YouTube so that all of these videos, all of these, um, uh, academics has been archived in this arthroscopy society of nepal uh, youtube channel so this is pcl injury topic uh, discussion which we have done last time so <clears throat> so pcl injury as uh, i always say used to be considered as lord baldemort of uh, harry potter one that uh, should not be named or one that should not be discussed but we have uh, come along a long way and uh, now we are talking about talking more about PCL and uh, this has been a second uh, panel discussion or second topic about uh, second uh, discussion about the PCL. So this um, uh, our uh, panelists for today, the esteemed panelists for today and all our seniors has um, done so much hard work so that this PCL uh, is being discussed uh, more often nowadays. So <clears throat> my question is regarding the graft. So Rajiv sir, what is your ideal graft? Which graph do you choose for uh, the uh, PCL reconstruction? Uh, the ideal graft, I think I would choose first is the hamstrings and then maybe the uh, quadriceps tendon graft. Okay. Uh, is it the same uh, with you, Navin, sir? Yes, with the uh, first, my graft choice is the hamstring, that is semitendinosis and gracilis. And another second is uh, peritoneus longus nowadays. If combined injury is there, then my choice is peritoneus longus. Uh, same question to Amit sir. Amit sir, are you there? Yeah, Vivek, I'm here, yes. So what is your ideal graft? Uh, the isolated PCL injury, you have decided surgery. So which graft will you take? Uh, hamstring, quadriceps, or peritoneus? For, uh, for isolated, it is hamstring. Any reason, sir, uh, the, the you are taking hamstring? Uh, many reasons. Uh, number one is uh, uh, most comfortable to take, uh, easy to take, and patient doesn't have an incision on the peroneus, and we don't know long things about peroneus. Quadriceps, uh, as uh, Sushil was saying, uh, quadriceps is uh, quite important in 
you know, uh, important in that parallelogram concept. Uh, the, so the recent literature is also saying that uh, the quadriceps is not as good as, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, proposed. So hamstring is the first choice. If hamstring is not possible, then I'll take peroneus. Uh, then only my third choice will be uh, quadriceps. So what must be your size or length, the diameter and length of the graph for PCL reconstruction? Uh, I would definitely like to have about, um, you know, nine, minimum of nine to 10 mm of the um, graph for the PCL reconstruction. Uh, length, uh, uh, about, uh, you know, 120, that is the minimum that is required for the reconstruction of the PCL. So if you take hamstring graph, uh, do you regularly get nine, centi nine millimeter diameter size and 12 centimeter of uh, length? Are you getting yeah, the 12 centimeter of the length is uh, quite, uh, you know, common. Uh, uh, as far as the diameter is concerned, sometime it is uh, 8.5. But uh, nowadays I use uh, remnant preservation. So probably 8.5 is uh, good enough for me. Okay, sir. Navin, sir, the same question, the size, diameter and length. And are you getting this uh, diameter and this length, your required diameter and length with your quadricep graph? Uh, in, with the hamstring graft, I usually get maybe 8, 8.5. With that, I am satisfied. Lengthwise, uh, tell, because I use uh, endovertan fixation on the femoral side, so even 10 millimeter length is also okay for me. 10 so millimeter. 9 millimeter diameter and 10, millim, uh, 10 centimeter length. Okay, okay. I think, uh, Rajiv, sir, any difference in opinion? Uh, Vivek, the thing is basically, see, uh, I, I think 8.5 8 is okay, because what are we trying to do? We're trying to cover about 75% of the graft size, right? We're not trying to make a complete PCL. Uh, PCL is about, you said, about 13 mm. So if we get about 75% of coverage, I think that's more than enough. Now, uh, this is the thing. If you're doing a single bundle PCL reconstruction, uh, I think the, the hamstring Vivek, graft is good. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was just reading uh, Laprat's yeah. paper who said that for um, ALB enterolateral bundle, he uses 11 size. Yes, graft. yes, yes. And for uh, posterolateral, uh, posteromedial, <laughs> he uses um, seven size. So probably that is too big for uh, our population. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> for single, probably if you are doing your is good enough. Okay, so can we uh, conclude that for Nepalese population, uh, 8.5 to 9 millimeter is adequate graph size for uh, diameter size for PCL reconstruction. And you must have almost about 10 centimeter, minimum 10 centimeter length to have good ACL reconstruction, PCL reconstruction. So I think that may be the uh, conclusion of this, uh, this slide. So uh, next is, uh, is it myth or reality, uh, Rajiv sir? The killer turn, killer turn. Whenever we talk about PCL reconstruction, uh, the killer turn comes along. What is it? Is it myth or reality? What do you think? I I think I think it is more of a reality because a lot of research has gone into it, and uh, they have found that if you do not uh, obliterate the killer turn, then it leads to a lot of uh, failures of your PCL injury. And there are a lot. Of, I think there are a couple of techniques that you can encompass to get rid of this killer turn. Right, like we can discuss that. I think in the following yeah, slides, yeah, right? Vivek, or should so, I say so, it now? So, in your practice, uh, how many PCL uh, yeah. uh, PCL failures uh, you have had? I haven't had PCL uh, complete failures, but there is the results are not as good as ACL. They land up with a certain amount of laxity. So, like in ACL, where once the ACL healed, you get rock solid. There's the absolute negative lacman. But in a PCL, there is a bit of lack. That's so do you think they are because of uh, the skeletal turn not at risk? Uh, Vivek, I have learned to deal because see, uh, I have learned to uh, deal with the killer turn quite early in my practice. Okay, I was taught to deal with it during my fellowship also. There are certain things that I do to deal with the killer turn, okay, okay than a traditional ACL, like so, things that probably Sushil also has mentioned, and uh, definitely one is coming a little low, okay, so you have so to avoid the killer turn. We'll talk about that. I have yeah, few okay. questions regarding that as well. So what do you think? The, this killer turn is one-time phenomena when you <clears throat> um, place your graph. Or this is the dynamic one. Uh, I think it's a dynamic one. 
it's a dynamic one it keeps on eating at the graft if it is not correct placed uh, what not placed correctly which leads to failure so okay. it continues mowing at the graft of that area and then it fails okay so as um, uh, uh, Rajiv sir has rightly mentioned this is not the single time effect. This is the dynamic process because the sap is at the tibial tunnel, the mouth of the tibial tunnel uh, continuously knows, continuously hits, continuously abrates the graft over there. And this is the study that has shown the ultra microscopic picture and the gross picture of that graft after about 2000 cycles of uh, flexion and extension. So killer turn is real. It is not myth. And you, we have to do all those things which can reduce the effect of killer turn. So <clears throat> there are many uh, techniques that can reduce the killer turn. So I will start with you, uh, Rajiv sir. What do you do uh, to reduce the killer turn effect? Uh, number one, what I do is when I drill my tibial tunnel I and the femoral tunnel, I use a chamfer. It's a semicircular type of a chamfer. It's type of a, you could call it a rasp or a chamfer. So I chamfer the part of the graft so, to reduce that killer turn. Okay. Uh, first of all, when, may, when I make my tunnel, I make my tunnel slightly low. So there is a uh, there, there, there is no sharp bend there. Okay. okay. As Sushil mentioned very nicely in his diagnostic picture, number one. And the number two, that is. So number one, I the tunnel that I place itself is uh, placed so I can reduce that killer turn. Number two, I chamfer the ends where the graft is going to take that edge. I chamfer the edge and make it rounded. Like you do in a total knee, I chamfer it. You now when okay. you make a chamfer okay. cut. Okay. And uh, third of all, I try and make an anterolateral entry. So if I make an anterolateral entry, that definitely reduces that bend okay, because it right. is definitely better than an anteromedial entry. So I you drill from the anterolateral proximal tibia, right, sir? Yes, yes, from the anterolateral tibial. You, you, I think you, you guys also do it. That is very, very comfortable. If you go from there, that reduces the killer turn, I find, in many cases. Okay. Uh, Amit, sir, your take on this thing? <clears throat> I think absolutely what Rajiv said, um, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, uh, I preserve some amount of the soft tissue, you know, I do not remove all the soft tissue uh, on the superior part of the tunnel. So if you preserve some amount of, some amount of soft tissue, it will also act as a padding to the, you know, your graft. So uh, you go a little below, uh, below uh, than the normal uh, footprint, number one. Number two, you do a chamfer. That means you blunt the sharp is uh, at the exit of the tunnel and then preserve some amount of soft tissue. I do not go from the anterolateral. I use the same uh, anteromedial uh, entry at the anterior part of the uh, okay. fibula, sorry, fibula. Thank you. Thank you, Amit sir. So, Navin sir, this is very important topic. So, I would like to get your opinion as well. Yeah, first of all, uh, earlier I used to do the um, this trivial inlet talk technique. There, there was no chance of killer turn. Initial four or five cases I have done with that. But because of the conversion issue, I went into the trans -tibial. So, so go from medial side, uh, whatever already been said regarding the use of that rasp and all those things, I try to be more central and more vertical. So the TVL tunnel, the jig usually I use around maybe 55 to 60 so that it is more vertical. Besides that, I want to uh, use a longer size screw and quite closer to the TVL exit on that part. So the, it, it is central, number one, another long size screw and more down, as Amit has said, and Rajiv also pointed out, more down. So these three things I want to main focus to avoid the killer turn. So that the graft is more vertical, that avoid the acute curve. Absolutely. So many things has been answered by our panelists and uh, I did literature review on this topic and what I found was, as Rajiv sir has mentioned, while we drill from the lap medial size, uh, medial, anteromedial side, anteromedial tibia as we usually do, what happens is there is more of a killer turn effect than when we drill from the lateral side. And this has been proven by biomechanical study, cadaveric study, and even uh, the clinical studies. So what happens is when we drill from anterolateral side, the angle between the uh, two limbs of the uh, PCL uh, graph becomes very, very more. It, it becomes increased. That's why there will, there will be less killer turn effect. Second thing is we can all together uh, decrease or negate this killer turn effect if we do the uh, the TBL inlet technique, but there is technical problem, technical hits with this um, the inlet technique. And another technique is the way we drill. The exit point 
if we make at the finally uh, point that is more posterior and more lateral to the exact anatomical landmark or exact anatomical footprint of the uh, uh, tibial uh, tibial attachments of PCL, it has been shown that the uh, the what happens the kiloton effect is decreased, and this has been proven by multiple studies. And uh, what they have proven that clinical and biomechanical stability that these PCL reconstruct non anatomy though it is non anatomical PCL reconstruction now, the there is no difference in clinical stability or biomechanical stability of this PCL reconstruction. So uh, drilling at the more inferior and more lateral position that is called finally point is also one of the trick that reduces the kiloton effect. And another uh, technique, another tip, how we can reduce the kiloton effect is to make, to, to um, put the screws, to put the interference screw more closer, the, to keep the fixation device more closer to the posterior tibial exit. Because what happens if there is uh, the fixation at the proximal tibial exit, the anterior tibial exit, there will be more motion at the posterior graft part and there will be more uh, kiloton effect. And another is, as uh, all of our panelists has already mentioned, we have to rest the sub border of the posterior border of the uh, tibial mouth so that there will be less of the kiloton effect. So uh, these are various techniques by which we can reduce the kiloton effect. And what um, now my qu next question is to Navin sir, we are always worrisome or we always fear about the vascular injury that may uh, occur during the PCL reconstruction that in the, during the uh, drilling of the posterior uh, the tibial tunnel. So what are your tips and tricks to reduce this uh, posterior uh, post popliteal artery injury during this PCL reconstruction? Yeah, first of all is the position of the knee. You know, at the 90 degree flexion, the vessels automatically go a little bit back. Besides that, uh, usually the uh, exact, uh, both the posterior portal I do not use. Usually I use the posterior medial portal only. But what I do in posterior medial itself, I make two portals. One is the superior, another is the inferior. From superior posterior medial part, I pass my scope. And from the in, uh, inferior, uh, this posterior medial portal, I pass my saber and the other instrument to rasp over there. And I uh, the, usually I use the jig of the TVL classical uh, a jig put from the anterior side and I under vision, if I cannot see the posterior part very clearly, never I proceed. I either go with the Fanelli technique that is we discussed, I put my finger over there or use the CM. So the first and foremost is I have to be very much sure that all the posterior structures, whatever I am doing is under vision. When I am sure that I am able to see, then I pass my beat fin. And once I feel that the posterior cortex is co coming, then I stop the drilling and start the hammer. Another vision I see over there, and all the time I keep my uh, that jig over there. When okay. the guide war, this uh, guide wire has come, then I keep on hammering over there so that the, that protected guide wire go posterior, and that pushes the neurovascular bundle further posterior. So on on top of so that position 90 degree flexion under vision the guide wire has come, and keep keeping that the protecting device over there all the time. Then only I drill so that I am very much sure that my neurovascular bundle is seated posteriorly. Okay. So these are the, some of the tricks I okay. use. Thank you, sir. So your trick is uh, to to keep the knee, uh, knee in flex position, 90 to 100 degree. Then dissect or uh, use instruments whenever under complete vision. Uh, that is your trick. So, Amit, sir, any more tricks? Uh, I think uh, the position is up. Absolutely agree. 90 degree, 90, 95 degree is the correct position. Second, I go with the transeptal approach by which you will be visualizing everything. Uh, and then uh, Navin very clearly mentioned that until unless you see, you should not drill. So you visualize the posterior part, then you gradually go with your beat pin. And then while going with the beat pin, there is one important trick that I do is when I pass my jig and on the stylet of the jig or in the bullet of the jig, I measure what is the length of the, what is the length of the tunnel. So once you measure that length of the tunnel, suppose it came, comes about 55, then you mark that 55 from the edge of the bullet to into the beat pin so that you know that you have reached 45. So when your beat pin uh, goes inside by 45 or 50, whatever measurement has come, then you go very slowly and vision is very important. Your vision has to be very, very clear. And when you exit, 
then you can use your uh, PCL jig or you can use a bead pin catcher. This is, there is a special device which is called a bead pin catcher. So you can use either the jig or the bead pin catcher. Then you hammer the bead pin so that uh, your bead pin tip is protected and it pushes your jig, you know, it pushes your jig back so that your all the structures have gone back and your tip of the bead pin is protected. Then uh, the tibia will be visible and then you start rimming. Uh, a recent technique I have learned is a gradual rimming rather than directly rimming with the eight and nine. It is uh, advised to rim with uh, four mm first, which is a sharp rimmer and a small rimmer, which is very easy to visualize. And then after four mm, then you start rimming with the bigger one. So it will be very easy to rim the posterior cortex because anterior cortex, there is no risk. You can push as much as you want. The posterior cortex, if you want to rim with hand also, it is sometimes very difficult. So if you rim with a 4 mm and then 6 mm and then 8 or 9 mm, then it becomes very easy. So and all the time, either I use a bead pin catcher or I use a jig so that it acts as a protector for the posterior structure and the pushes the posterior structure behind so that I have enough space um, anteriorly. So uh, that that was uh, some wonderful tricks. So uh, the main trick, I think, main point we have to make is while making the posterior tibial tunnel, the uh, tunnel at the posterior side of the tibia, uh, one needs to do one needs to uh, have a good vision of that posterior part, the posterior footprint area, posterior jig area. The tip of jig must be visible to proceed. So uh, my question to uh, Rajiv sir is uh, if he has um, um, he uses the anterior lateral drilling technique. So uh, literature says that there is some advantage with this anterior lateral technique uh, regarding the risk of vascular injuries as well. So have you had some experience regarding this thing because you uh, drill with the exactly. anterior lateral side? Exactly, Vivek. Uh, uh, the reason why I started using the anterior lateral portal was why I stumbled onto this paper. I don't exactly, I read it quite some, yeah, this is the paper that I stumbled onto, right? And this paper told me that if I use the anterior lateral portal, number one, I have less risk regarding the vascular structures. And number two, it reduces the killer turn. So this was a very, with a technique with a lot of advantage. So then I started using this. And like my other two uh, co uh, uh, colleagues have already mentioned, those are the different techniques that we use. Now, initially when I was using only a posterior medial portal and uh, doing uh, more of uh, removal of the uh, PCL bundle, uh, definitely the vision was more important. And through there, I was passing that uh, PCL jig. It's got that, uh, with that uh, bead pin stopper, no? that jig. So that uh, you go behind the PCL, do, do a soft tissue dissection there. So that gives you a lot of leeway to get good vision uh, in front of the vascular structures. And number two, now when we're doing remnant preservation, when we do a transeptal technique, the vision is very, very good. Okay, initially there'll be a little bit of fear to make that transeptal thing. I think for beginners, there'll be a little bit of fear, but once you get used to this technique, there's a lot of vision. A lot of okay. Vivek, so I, think Vivek, I, I just want to uh, Vivek. I just want to add that we have to understand the anatomy, and the uh, main popliteal artery is more towards the lateral side, from not in the right and the midline. It is three to four mm towards the lateral side. So your picture clearly says that uh, if you go from medial, more medial, then probably it is going to uh, your exiting your bead pin is exiting towards the lateral side. So. Again, it is important to go dot anterior, not from the medial side. It has to be from the anterior side or um, as uh, I have never tried this, um, uh, you know, entry from the lateral tibial condyle, but seems very appealing that uh, uh, entry from the lateral condyle will definitely avoid the vascular injury. So uh, I stumbled upon this <clears throat> paper while preparing for this uh, panel discussion. And uh, this, this is quite appealing because it says that anterolateral drillings, just uh, changing your drill position from anteromedial to anterolateral side, the killer turn effect is drastically reduced and the chance of vascular injuries are uh, maximally reduced. In this, this is the cadaveric study. They dissected uh, the knee and they made the, um, the tibial tunnel with usual zigs from anterolateral and anteromedial uh, drilling technique. And what they found out that uh, the, the drilling from anteromedial side was invariably associated, the, the pin was directed towards the vascular structures, but no pins 
drill from the anterolateral side was directed towards the vascular structure. So they uh, finalized, they concluded that anterolateral drilling is more safer and more better option than the intermediate, traditional anteromedial drilling. So I think but, we have to think. Vivek, about, yes. Uh, just if you understand the anatomy of the lateral part of the condyle and the medial part, it is it is more slopy on the lateral side. So uh, entry from the lateral side is a little, you know, will be a little difficult. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Rajiv will share. They, they, they have mentioned that uh, while entering from the anterolateral uh, drilling technique, you remain just lateral to the tibial tuberosity. At, at, as they, so they have also mentioned the exact point from where they have to enter. So, uh, so uh, this is also physiotherapy part is also very important uh, while doing the PCL reconstruction. I have um, come from right from the um, graft uh, to discuss today because I think many of things has been covered by previous two talks and we have discussed more in previous panel discussion. So Amit sir, your physio take on physiotherapy. Uh, I'm, I'm more aggressive. It depends upon what are the structure um, I have uh, reconstructed. Uh, it depends physiotherapy will change uh, according to that but for isolated pcl i do the aggressive um, um, accelerated rehabilitation protocol and all those exercise that i that is given to acl is done the same exercise but in the prone position you see uh, the concept i have is if the patient is in supine position without the braces uh, the gravity will pull the tibia down like uh, you are showing this position the gravity will pull the tibia down and there is a possibility of loosening or slacking of the graft. So I do all the exercise uh, in the prone position, at least for initial six weeks. Uh, uh, that is what uh, my change uh, in the general, you know, isolated PCL reconstruction. Yes, indeed, that is very important point because uh, once you do prone positioning range of motion and poor prone uh, exercises, all those exercises in prone position, what happens is the effect of gravity is negated and effect of hamstring tendon is also uh, negated. So a prone physiotherapy, prone range of motion, and more of a uh, quadriceps exercise than hamstring exercise is a way to go in this uh, physiotherapy protocol post-PCL reconstruction. And uh, what is your take on arthritic knees, PCL reconstruction in arthritic knees? Uh, 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 Rajiv, sir, do you reconstruct PCL uh, injuries in arthritic knees if you get the arthritic knees in x-rays no I, I don't think it's a good idea to do pcl reconstruction arthritic knees what do you mean exactly by arthritic knees so grade two grade three um, the arthritis or osteoarthritis osteoarthritis with varus deformity and things like that yes 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 no definitely not because the pcl will fail so i think uh, there is a there is definitely uh, if if the patient has a varus deformity then you should under the patient should undergo a high tibial osteotomy because see in that uh, if there's malalignment, then any recon ligament reconstruction will fail. So you must correct the malalignment and then maybe in the same stage or in a later stage go in for a PCL reconstruction. So absolutely. So whenever there is deformed, there is uh, arthritic knees, always look about the alignment and uh, correct the alignment first before doing the ligamentous surgery. So let us go for in cases, our cases. The case number one, I would like, uh, um, Rajiv sir, you take this case, sir. Uh, the 47 years male, he is an he is office worker. He had history of ACL reconstruction three years back. He was okay. He was okay, not absolutely perfect for two years. Now he had some minor twist and his knees are not okay since then. On examination, his Lachman test is positive. Pivot chip test is positive. Entry door, posterior door, both are positive and he has grad, uh, posterior sac grade two or grade three. So how will you approach? So he had ACL reconstruction two years back. So how common is this uh, scenario, sir? Patient with, mm. with ACL and PCL tear, uh, they, mm. they reconstructed just the ACL. Okay. So I, I don't think this is very common that they should, uh, I mean, you know, they should just repair, reconstruct the ACL. I think if you talk about it, the PCL needs reconstruction and the ACL needs reconstruction. Okay, uh, Amit sir, yeah. how common yeah. is this scenario yeah. in your practice? Uh, you know, the gravity of this kind of yeah. uh, so this kind of cases are very high, but they are not very common. You know, uh, actually, this case had both ACL and PCL tear, but I think only ACL was reconstructed. That is the reason why uh, the his ACL failed. 
Okay. So, uh, can we conclude that these type of scenarios are not so much common in our practice? So, uh, mm. Amit sir, how will you proceed in this case? Uh, first, um, assess the alignment. Uh, uh, if you have already done MRI, uh, which shows that uh, ACL and PCL are torn, uh, then I'll see in MRI what are what are the status of the cartilage uh, in the MRI, and then I'll do a scanogram for sure for this patient, uh, identify if there is a alignment twist or not. And then only I'll decide any surgery for this patient. If there is an osteoarthritic feature, uh, the treatment will be completely different. If there are no osteoarthritic, the treatment will be completely different from what. Uh, so you will advise scanogram for alignment, then MRI to see all those things? MRI, MRI if done or not, okay. MRI, and then scanogram. And CT scan? Would you like to do CT scan as well, sir? Because it is the... Uh, I, I don't think in this particular case, uh, CT scan is so much beneficial for me. Because it is uh, revision ACL, would you like to see the tunnel status? Oh, uh, yeah. For that reason, definitely. For that reason, I I love to see, uh, uh, measure the tunnel status to determine what to do with the ACL. Yes. Okay. So this is his clinical picture. The ACL and PCL were gone. Lachman test anterior posterior Lachman was positive. You can see grade two sac, and puberting was also positive. So this was uh, ACL and PCL tear at first hand, and the PCL tear was missed, and ACL reconstruction only was done. That's why he was just okay after that ACL reconstruction, never better, and he uh, the eventually the that ACL graft uh, give, gave away, and the, uh, now he presented with both symptoms of ACL and PCL tear. So this is the CT scan. And we can see, as we can see, there is uh, some dilatation of the tunnel uh, and the femoral tunnel of ACL does not seem, seem to be in the right place. And this is MRI. We can see ACL and PCL seems to be intact in this case. Uh, Rajiv, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. PCL yeah. shadow seems to be intact in this case. What is your take on this? Uh, my take is Vivek. I don't rely on the MRI itself for a PCL shadow. I would do a stress test to find out whether the PCL needs reconstruction or not. Yes, absolutely. So an MRI saying, especially you know these MRIs saying partial tear of the PCL, they're very dangerous MRIs. You must get a stress test and see whether the PCL is actually functioning or not, and then I think you can decide. So that is the very important point we have to make. In chronic tears of PCL, like uh, three, three, three months or four months old PCL injuries, MRI may look completely normal because those fibers may have healed, but those may have healed in the wrong place because of which there may be, uh, the, in MRI, whole of the PCL may look intact, but these, these may be the case of PCL insufficiency on clinical examination. So diagnosis or decision-making of PCL injury must be done on clinical examination and on stress access, not on MRI. So that is very important point uh, Rajiv Sarai brought up. So this is the alignment X-ray as uh, Amit Sarai has mentioned, the knee is slightly in valgus, the reconstructed knee is slightly in valgus, not in varus as we has expected. So this is the stress X-ray as Rajiv sir has um, uh, advised. So this is stress X-ray, we can see a whole of the posterior sag compared to the uh, normal knee. So there is posterior sag, uh, I think it is great more than grade two. So we decided uh, to go for PCL reconstruction and ACL reconstruction in this case. And this was the clinical picture. The, the ACL fibers, the graft were completely torn and there was nothing left in the uh, knots. There was some scar of PCL tissues still there. And we started dissecting at the uh, lateral femoral condyle and we uh, discovered the screw that was the titanium screw. We removed that screw and after removal of that screw, what we found was the tunnel position was uh, uh, not in the uh, right place. So this is the tunnel position as we can see. Uh, this is the tunnel position, very anterior and very superior. So I mean, sir, uh, what may be the cause of failure in this case, uh, the wrong tunnel placement or uh, the PCL not being reconstructed? Uh, maybe uh, the first and foremost is uh, PCL has been missed. Uh, so that is the main cause of uh, failure of the uh, ACL. And along with the, along with the you know, wrong placement of the TV, uh, femoral tunnel of the ACL, both. But if you reconstruct ACL 
without addressing a grade three PCL, it is bound to fail. So my question is why it fails? Uh, because of the ab abnormal loading of the you know uh, uh, graft, it will it will fail. Okay, okay. So, so um, the moral of uh, story from the first case is always assess for the posterior sag, always assess for the PCL injury, always do some examination of PCL injury. The PCL diagnosis from clinical examination is very easy. Vivek, uh, Vivek uh, here, here I just want to add, and uh, Rajiv and Navin will probably you know agree with me that most of the time for the beginners the pcl tier are appreciated as a acl tier you know this is a very important message we should give yes so yes. when you examine a pcl tier the tbi is already sagged so when you pull it anteriorly you will find out that there is an anterior drawer the tbi is moving anteriorly actually it is not tbi moving anteriorly it is from the sag position it is coming to the neutral position that is a very very important that is why i always say that rather than looking at the translation it is important also to feel the in point how hard the in point is so this is a very important thing we must know that uh, a false uh, entire drawer test can be possible in case of uh, pcl tier yes sir that is very uh, important another thing yeah Vivek, what yes. is the uh, what is the profession of this individual this 47 year old gentleman he is office goer, sir. He is government's office. Office goer. Okay. Uh, it's very sad that this happened to him. It's very sad. And uh, the examination under anesthesia also, I think, is very important. Now, so if you did not assess a patient properly on, you know, prior to the surgery, you must always do an anesthesia uh, assessment prior to anesthesia, and always be honest with the patient. Now, whatever you found there, you found. If you had, in, but, but I mean, you could have always managed to do a PCL if you had found. Uh, a, that the patient had a PCL injury on the table also. Yes, absolutely. A one stage PCL and ACL, which would, would have, I mean, you know, the consequences would have been very good for this patient if that had been done earlier. Yes, Anyways, yes whatever. Uh, nice. So, 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 lesson learned from this case is, as Amit sir has mentioned, there is thing called a false positive anterior drawer test. So we have to be very careful about that thing, because uh, as we do anterior drawer from the posterior sac position, we may falsely. Uh, get the positive uh, feel of that excursion um, in enter draw test or enactment test. <clears throat> but we must be careful in these cases that the end point will be hard. So end point must be considered first than the excursion. Another thing is always try to elicit the posterior sac. If there is posterior sac, then there will be PCL tear. In every case of uh, knee injuries, always rule out PCL injury first before uh, you, you diagnose uh, there is an ACL tear or some other tear. So PCL injury, if missed, will have grave prognosis. It has been shown in the uh, literature that it is more grave, it is more uh, worse than the ACL injury. If ACL injury is missed, that is not so much worse than PCL injury because long-term injury, long-term result with missed PCL injury is definitely an osteoarthritis. So <clears throat> let us go for the second case. Uh, Navin sir, um, I, I would like you to take this case. This is case number two, 40 years male. He has history of RTA. He sustained injury over his right knee. Knee is grossly deformed and painful. Dorsalis pedis artery is feeble. This is his X-ray. <clears throat> so, how will you proceed? So, uh, see, seeing the X-ray, it appears is a uh, fracture dislocation of the right knee with a probably vascular injury. As you said, dorsalis pedis is feeble. So, first and foremost, is uh, we'll have to look for the vascular involvement. So, if the facilities are available, then I will go ahead with the CT NGO. So my question to Navin sir is, will you do CT NGO first or any Doppler study first or will you reduce it first? No, uh, seeing the, if the facility is available, uh, first of all, seeing this X-ray immediately, I will reduce it, bring it to the neutral position. And then again, I reassess the dorsalis pedis. Still it is feeble, my saturation is low and I, my facility is available. I will go for the dorsalis. So my question to I, I have a yes sir yeah. So my question and to the, after yes, yes sir please continue sir. Yeah, you can see it is grossly deformed at that time. So with a simple gentle traction you can reduce it and then again reassess. And if you you the things improve after the reduction then I can 
just go for dorsalis pedis. If it's still the features is like that, then I will straight away go with the CT NGO to rule out the vascular injury. So Raju sir, will you reduce it first or will you do vascular study first? Because there is so much of fuss in Nepalese population nowadays. What happens is if you reduce it and you get feeble pulses, they they may um, they may say that if it is because of you, because, uh, the vascular injuries has happened. So what will you do? Rajiv, I, I think yes, I think what I, what I think what I'll do is first of all see I will counsel the patient I will reduce the knee I will do an ankle brachial index okay and if it is no I will go in for a CT angiogram. Absolutely, that point is very very important I think because once you find the uh, feeble pulses in this type of condition you have to counsel uh, beforehand to all the patient and patient parties regarding the uh, possibility of vascular injuries and regarding the need of early reduction so we have to reduce it first. Uh, counsel first, then reduce, and then do the vascular examination if the pulses are still feeble. Uh, yes, 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 sir. Yes, yes can, sir. Can I just add uh, on this case regarding what we learned from this yes, case? Is a comparison of the bilateral dorsalis pedis, which is very, very important. Yes. Uh, yes. Vivek, Vivek gave a hint that the pulse was feeble, but actually, if you if you take if you take if I would have taken the pulse on the affected leg immediately, I wouldn't have feel that this is feeble. This was feeble in comparison to the other one. So whenever we have a fracture or dislocation around the knee, probably comparative um, pulsation of both the limb, that is what uh, very, very important in this particular case. This patient actually had pulse, but this pulse was less in compared to the uh, normal one. That is how we detected that uh, this could be, there could be something with the vessel. Absolutely, sir. This was the condition. With, this is post-reduction X-ray, sir. Uh, Navin, sir. Pulse is still feeble uh, uh -huh. compared to other side, and this is the post-reduction X-ray. So, what what do you find, and what is your uh, plan now? <clears throat> so here, uh, knee appears uh, reduced, uh, and the still you are telling that the feeble pulse is there. So, I still I have a doubt to rule out the vascular injury. For that. Uh, CT NGO is my first choice. So, what is your diagnosis, sir, with this X-ray? Uh, uh, the dislocation of the knee with the fracture patella and the query vascular injury. So, what? What? Vessel, so vessel injury. There is some uh, bony bony prominences, bony fractures, uh, bony pieces in the posterior side. Is this PCL abalone or PCL regarding something with the PCL? What do you think it is? Yeah, beside uh, anteriorly patellar of fracture is there and on the post, on the AP view also near the, in the lateral view, uh, it's not very clear, but I can make out some fragment has uh, gone up is the avulsion fracture of the PCL. Okay. Uh, Rajiv sir, is it PCL avulsion fracture for you as well or something else? Uh, I'm not really sure if it's a PCL avulsion fracture, but see, there is a posterior sag. There is a posterior, I mean, this is not a true lateral view, but I think there is a posterior sag, but the PCL attachment is a little extra articular. So I don't think it's coming from the tibial side. Okay. If okay. it's coming from the femoral side, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's coming from the tibial side. So as, as uh, suggested by the panelists, we did the angiography, CT angiogram in this case, because pulse was still feeble even after the reduction. And this is what we could uh, find with uh, the CT angio. The, there was big, huge, there was fragment, bony fragment that was impinging over the popliteal artery. So Rajiv sir, uh, we have found out yes. the culprit. The, there was something that is impinging over the popliteal vessel because of which there is feeble pulse. So how will you approach now? Uh, this patient, uh, well, I'll, I'll definitely try and reduce that, take out that fragment and uh, uh, what, correct that compression on the vascular structures. So what do you think this uh, this fragment is from PCL or this fragment is uh, the free one? Uh, let me see the wait one sec. I think it's probably a free one. Free one, okay. I think it's probably a free one. Uh, Navin sir, what do you think? This is PCL avalzone or something else? Uh, it's difficult to say, but uh, still I feel it is uh, coming from TBR only. It has gone up okay. and compressing the popliteal vessel. So how will you how will you manage this case? This is the emergency case. So we have to uh, counsel the patient regarding explaining everything. And first and foremost, uh, 
uh, I will go and uh, fix the that take out that fragment over there. If it is coming from the open technique, my talk technique will be open. If that fragment is from the this TBL the PCL, then I will go and fix with the screws depending on the size of the this. And at the same time, I will fix the patella also. Okay. Uh, so why why open, sir? Why not arthroscopic? See, because this is a uh, size to me appears approximately one point five sort of thing. And it's very acute case also, so the fear of extra vasation and all those things anteriorly also paralyzed fracture. So I think open will be uh, better for me. Uh, Rajiv sir, open or arthroscopic? Uh, Vivek, if if you show me more slides of the CT and if I think it's a PCL avulsion or, or a loose fragment also, I would go arthroscopically. Arthroscopically, sir. So what no what may be the problem? I would try arthroscopically at least. Okay. Uh, are there any problems that you foresee while you do arthroscopic technique in this case? Yes, a lot of problems because you, there'll be a lot of hemarthrosis. Okay. There'll be a lot of hemarthrosis, but it'll give me a good view inside the joint if I can clear a little bit of the hemarthrosis. And then in front, I would have to make an anterior incision to go and fix the patella. Okay. So this was the CT angiogram report and this is the MRI picture. And there was certainly a case, this was certainly a case of PCL avulsion, but that... Uh, fragment was not coming up from PCL. That was the fragment which was impinging over the popliteal artery was a free fragment. So we did the open technique. I think Amit sir. Hey, uh, we ju we just, just clarify. Yes, sir. we just clarify that there was a, if you go to your CT scan. Couldn't see the CT. Yeah, if you see the CT, the, the fragment actually, uh, we initially we thought that this fragment is the avulsion of the PCL. But actually, this fragment was free. If you go more uh, anterior, you will find out another small fragment. You see, mm. posteriorly, there is another small fragment that was actually the PCL avulsion. Yes. So that was more clear in this. Area. Can you can you point out because uh, my pointer is not working? Go into the city. Go into the city. Same yes. Yeah. My pointer yeah, okay. is also not working. Okay. The the fragment which is impinging the popliteal artery was the free fragment. fragment and the fragment which oh. was anterior to that thing was the fragment from PCL avulsion. PCL avulsion. Okay. okay so this is MRI and I think Amit sir uh, will highlight more in this talk uh, more in this case because he was the main uh, surgeon in this case so we decided to go open so Amit sir yeah actually uh, since uh, this was an issue of a vascular impingement uh, the, the we thought that the PCL initially when we went inside we thought that that is a PCL avulsion, the big fragment is of the PCL avulsion. So since that was a PCL avulsion and we have to fix that, so probably um, I agree with Nabin, arthroscopically it would have been very, very difficult and very risky because it was just touching the vessel. So uh, releasing that would have been very difficult. So we decided to go ahead with the open technique. First, we isolated the vessel, uh, confirmed the integrity of the vessel. It was just compression and then we went in and fixed that fragment. Okay. So uh, the the um, the lesson from this case is uh, there may be vascular injury in cases of uh, the PCL injury or in cases of knee dislocation and we have to always rule out that and uh, the CT angiography and vascular studies uh, has to be done in uh, sparing no time and whenever if there are uh, problem if you foresee the problem with the arthroscopic technique always be ready with the open technique because open technique of pcl repair or open technique of posterior dissection is not an obsolete technique you can always shift to this and it may be some time of lifesaver so this was the fragment um, that was impinging over the posterior um, the <laughs> popliteal artery we could not fix it so we we excise it this was the fixation so I have one more interesting case. This was from patella. This was from patella, Vivek, or from? No, no, no. This was the fragment that was impinging over the uh, popliteal artery. No, no. That fragment of which which part? From the femoral part or patella part? Where? Tibia, sir. Tibia. tibia as okay. Well, sir. okay. So this is another interesting case. Uh, we have already this. The time is already eleven. So what um, should we continue or stop here, sir? Let's make this last, Vivek. Okay, so this is for you, sir. Uh, Amit, sir. 12 years male, history of fall from tree, injured left knee, 
He has grossly swollen and painful knee. The range of motion is painful. This case is uh, courtesy of uh, Nirabdai. He had this case. We discussed about this case. So I plan to discuss this case here. So 12 years male, pediatric PCL avulsion. Amit sir. Amit sir, we cannot hear you. Uh, okay, so I can see that the physis is not closed. PCL has evolved. I would love to do a clinical examination. So clinical examination, there is posterior side, great station. There is PCL insufficiency. Okay. So if it is uh, grade three, then I would love to fix this. So any more in imaging or investigation would you like to do, sir? Definitely, of course. Uh, MRI uh, is a choice of investigation for this particular patient. If yes. possible, CT scan. CT scan was done. Even also MRI was done. CT scan showed there is avulsion of uh, the PCL fragment, PCL posterior tibial spine avulsion, and physis were not fused. This is the MRI picture where you can see the PCL. This is the PCL avulsion fracture, classic PCL avulsion fracture in pediatric population. So now uh, what, what makes sir? I will do a transosseous with a very small, you know, uh, drill holes, a transosseous fixation under CM guidance. If uh, his growth is uh, too much of uh, remaining and if you're afraid of uh, uh, violating the physis, then I can go below the physis. Physial sparing can also be done. But in this case, I'll put uh, two small uh, screws onto the crater and pull the fragment down. Okay. Um, same suture bridge technique you will do, sir. Same suture bridge technique. So, uh, will you think about doing arthros open technique in this case so that we can uh, spare the physis very easily? I, you know, this is this is a uh, this is one uh, option that one can prefer uh, in uh, by doing a physial sparing so that your screw is just uh, you know above the physis. You can do that, but. Uh, I do not do an open technique. This is too much of, you know, cumbersome. And you still don't know how your screws are going, where your screws are going, what the screws are doing. Uh, I'm safe with a small, uh, two small 1.8 drills into the crater and pull them out. Okay. Uh, Naveen, sir, your take on this case. Uh, Amit, I have a question for Amit. Amit cell always does the arthroscopy. Amit, if the size of the fragment is very large, maybe 1.5 or 2, then also you go arthroscopically? Because it is very difficult to handle, no? That very big fragment with arthroscope. You, you are right, but uh, if it, the fragment is too large, it's more easier to reduce and pull it down. Uh, it sits more easily. There is another technique uh, in which you reduce provisionally fix and make a drill through the bone piece and put an indoor button and pull it down. So there are so many techniques uh, by which uh, you can, you know, manage a bigger fragment, but the bigger the fragment, easier to reduce and easier to pull. Uh, that is what I have learned uh, so far uh, with our experience of, uh, you know, evils and fractures. Uh, okay, Vivek, for, for me, this uh, this fracture fragment is again uh, relatively bigger at the other, besides that, the physis is also there. So I definitely want to protect the physis. So classical, my indication for uh, open fixation is very large fragment, maybe more than 1.5 and also the cost constraint for the patient. These two important are very, besides that, the physis I can see over there. So third indication I can also add the physis is there. So to protect the physis, I will go and fix the open with this. So screw. what will be your direction of screw, sir? Direct away from the physis, I will go will downward. Classical perpendicular to this fracture will not be there. I'll, I, I'll try to avoid the physis uh, relatively obliquely, I will go downward. So it will be all Maybe even. single it's screw with washer will work, yeah. Okay. So... Uh, I think Vivek, uh, yes, Vivek for, for the arthroscopy surgeon, uh, for, for, I mean, this can go either ways. I agree with Amit and with Naveen. For an arthroscopy surgeon, I agree with Amit. The classical thing is, I, I don't know about the endo button all, but you go distal to the physis. You make your normal PCL tunnel distal to the physis, do a suture bridge and fix it up. I mean, the literature has says excellent results. Only thing is you should mobilize early. Uh, you've shown me different ones, but I go with the one distal to the physis, the one in the middle. This yeah. is the most, I think, uh, good, one, yeah. good technique. Yeah. And this technique has the least amount of arthrofibrosis. 
because you can mobilize early for some reason. Uh, that, that's what they've mentioned in literature. That's what I could find in literature. Now, uh, if let's say people are not very versed, uh, not very uh, well versed with the arthroscopic technique, then you can go with the screw also. Because the reason being, see, when you dissect the tibia with the arth with the uh, with your what is that with the PCL jig, uh, you have to go quite distal than the PCL attachment. Okay, yeah. you have to go quite distal. So uh, people who may not be comfortable with this technique, so for them definitely a screw is okay. But otherwise, I would go with that middle technique, distal to the articular surface. So uh, Vivek, I I just want to say that uh, you know uh, this is uh, these eminence fractures are non-articular. This is intra-articular. But this doesn't take place in formation of a joint. So, so anatomic reduction, which was earlier thought of, may not be that much necessary. What you need is you need to tighten your ligament, pull it down, and your ligament is tight. So, avulsion fixation is not fixation of the fractures. Avulsion fixation yeah. is uh. fixation and tightening of your ligament. Absolutely, yes. So there, while I went through the literature for this uh, particular case, there were three various arthroscopic techniques that was mentioned. As you all have mentioned, the, uh, Amit sir and Rajiv sir, going right inferior to the uh, physis and drilling from there is the technique very commonly applied. And another technique is uh, doing all those techniques, uh, all those uh, drilling uh, through the epiphysis. This is a little difficult one and you need the CM guidance for both of these cases. And third one is uh, drilling through the transtibial, uh, usual transtibial through the physis. And this has been shown if the, um, the growth potential is not so much in those cases, we can uh, do this um, transficial drilling technique as well. And there are some literature in which they have mentioned that if you uh, maintain, if you maintain very small drilling in the uh, physis through the physis, the, there is no much of uh, growth arrest in future. So these are the three techniques of arthroscopic PCL repair. And you can uh, do all together differently by open technique, like uh, Navin Sarah has just mentioned. Uh, you can do all epiphysis drilling um, fixation with screws. You can do fixation, transficial fixation with screws, or you can uh, fix this thing uh, by the uh, use of some form of suture anchor. So this case was dealt perfectly by open technique. Uh, by uh, Nirabdai, he used, I think, uh, the suture anchor. I think, uh, Nirabdai, would you please come in and talk something about this case? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I talked with Vivek also, and uh, taking into consideration that the case is still is still open, uh, I went with the open technique, uh, the box and shaper approach, and trans epiphyseal. Uh, and the, the crater was above the physial line. So I just cleaned it and uh, put the uh, suture anchor uh, into the crater and, uh, and pull it down. It was a little difficult to pull it down and uh, tightened as uh, much as possible. Yes. So I think it, was, it is sitting over there. Yes. Thank you. Nice reduction. So uh, these are the various techniques. This does not mean that uh, it is not possible to do arthroscopically. Arthroscopically, it can be done as shown in the picture, but always uh, we can always think about the open technique as well. So this is my another case. Thank you so much for uh, patient hearing, patient listening. Uh, Vivek, that, uh, that case was, uh, Vivek, just me add, that case was very interesting. Uh, but what is important message I got from, and then I would like to give to all our colleagues is that whatever technique you use, either uh, uh, what Naveen says, uh, open technique, uh, we are doing arthroscopy, you use a kid of 12 years with PCL avulsion with grade three laxity should not be managed conservatively. That is what the mess uh, only comes from. Absolutely. Whatever technique you want to use, you use whatever technique you want. Avulsion is not a fracture. Again, avulsion is not a fracture. It is a ligament insufficiency. So you treat them the ligament injury. In a 12-year-old guy, if someone would have managed this case conservatively, would have landed in disaster at 20 years of age. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, all my esteemed panelists, for your time. Thank you so much, all our delegates, for your time. And I would like to request you all to follow the public health measures and stay safe. Thank you so much.
thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you vivek thank you so uh, we are at the end of uh, our today's uh, talk today's uh, program so i would like to request uh, our scientific chairman sailas ranjit kar sir uh, to say his few words and do uh, give a closing remark Sir, I think he is not around. Uh, I think uh, Ishwar sir can give uh, the closing remarks. Ishwar sir, I'm around. I'm around. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vivek. Uh, well, it was a very nice two hours discussion. We learned a lot. Um, I just want to say that uh, PCL injury, PCL reconstruction is not a simple thing. You know, it's uh, this is a very highly skilled, highly you know super specialized topic, but which was dealt very nicely here. Of course, we can't discuss everything here, but uh, this is like a stimulus for the younger generation to you know go back and look up a book and you know try to clarify further things. Uh, I tell you frankly, you know, when I started practicing way back about twenty, how many years? It's been nearly twenty-four years back. You know, we didn't know. We we never had a case of PCL injury to be done. You know, and it's been only maybe last six, seven years after Amit and our team joined up that we are being, you know, clear enough to diagnose PCL and do a perfect, um, you know, reconstruction or a repair. uh to the speakers you know susil had a very did a very excellent as always you know excellent presentation anatomy which i learned a lot and also to nirav you know very nice presentation i just wanted to say you know like uh, amit pointed out that the pcl indication for pcl reconstruction repair is number one pcl avulsion you know which has been stressed here and the other thing is if it is a multi ligament pcl and acl pcl reconstruction or a repair must be done because if you do just the acr or other ligament it will fail pcl nowadays is the uh, pivotal ligament in the knee and of course chronic acl pcl uh, injuries which you grade 3 which which nowadays you know uh, when people were doing open that was uh, discussed quite a few times before but now people are doing uh, arthroscopic and it's not just uh, i i wanted to give an advice to the younger generation also you see whenever you Uh, open up the youtube page and people talk about um, you know arthroscopic you know posterior uh, uh, po posterior medial portal reconstruction there is a little bit difference be between doing a transeptal and a posterior uh, reconstruction also you know transeptal means you have to make a posterior lateral as well as posterior medial and you see the whole but most of the youtube videos i see you know even from our indian counterparts like uh dr sundar rajan and all those you know even from amit pankaj and this uh, pani gra you know they make a posterior medial portal but transeptal means posterior lateral as well as posterior medial when you can see the whole thing you know that is very very well done in in our in our society you know which we want to stress uh while you know i don't want to take more time you know stay safe you know we are passing through a very difficult time you know everybody everywhere is you know diverted and very nice that we have this academic uh, uh, time to you know get together see each other you know in, encourage each other you know know the news uh, with that i want to say thank you to the to the speakers to the expert panelists and also the participants you know we had a record uh, participation maybe nearly 70 and thank you for bimal to coming coming in also you know spine guy here in an after coffee but yeah welcome we i i really enjoyed i really enjoyed I, I hope you didn't have anything to do. You know, stay at home. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everybody. Bye for now. Yeah.